in mid-19th century India, a man converted to Christianity by Welsh missionaries was confronted by the chief of his village. The chief commanded him to renounce his newfound faith in Christ or face grave consequences. In response to the chief's threats, however, the man only replied, Infuriated, the village chief dragged the man's family outside and began to threaten them with bodily harm. The man, unflinching, responded to the leader's ultimatum. Hot with rage and desperate to save face among the people, the village chief slaughtered the man's family in front of him. He turned his eyes to the steadfast convert, demanding that he either deny the works of Jesus or face his own death. In the center of the public square, the man was bound, beaten, thrown to the ground, and slowly crushed to death. But not without a final defiance of the village chief. As his bones were breaking and his lungs collapsing, the man's final words rang out in song through the village square. The call of Christ is clear. Forsake the dark and powerless system of this world and cling to the saving hope of the cross. Then and only then can you look to the shackles of your former life and declare that there is no turning back. Well, you're the ones that didn't go out of town, so I'm glad you're here. <laughs> Labor Day weekend. Um, we're in a series called Fighting Back. and we, I wanted to come back to the idea that uh, this year we want to understand that we are in a spiritual war, that spiritual warfare is going on, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. And sometimes Satan is so good at it that we don't realize it. We don't understand. And then sometimes Satan sneaks up on us. And we think we're ready. And we think, uh, you know, we're, we're close to God and we're really not. So today I want to talk about what it means to fully follow Jesus Christ. What does that look like in your life? What does that look like in your community? What does that look like in your world? Um, about 20 years ago when the rec center opened here, um, I used to go in there and work out a little bit, and i uh, never forget this one. And I, I could have swore they pushed him in on a wheelchair. I'm not sure, but not really. So he gets, out, he, he gets out of his wheelchair, but he comes towards me, and he is limping. You know, he's got a limp, and he says, would you care to play an old man in racquetball? There's a couple courts there, and I said to myself first, I, I paused. You know how you have this kind of conversation with yourself really quick? And I'm saying, well, this guy's old, and this guy's slow, and I'm, I was younger then, I, I'm fast, and I'm quick, and it won't be very long. I won't, you know, it won't take me very long. And I, and, you know, I'll just kind of get, you know, humor this old guy and go into the racquetball court and, uh, and, and be out quickly so I can move on my day. And so I go into the racquetball court, and the guy beats me 15 to nothing. I mean, I don't know that I even saw the ball. Now, I had the energy, and I had the quickness, and I could run, and he ran me, <laughs> but he understood where to place the ball. In racquetball, a lot of times it's all about control, con you know, controlling where the ball goes here or there. You know, in the Christian walk, there's some similarities there. And here's a similarity. When we go through difficult times in our lives, or when difficult times come into our lives, what really shines is what we've been doing to prepare for that difficult time. A lot of times, you know, we come to church and we're full of emotion. And, 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 and we're excited about Jesus. We're excited about the things of God. And yet, 
over time, that vim and that vigor and that excitement and the thrill and the, you know, then everyday life begins to set in. And we find ourselves drifting away from God. We find ourselves looking for the emotional highs in our lives to carry us on. And the truth of the matter is, folks, those don't work. You know, I was listening to a a little video clip, and if you want to see it, it's on my Facebook. I just posted it this morning, of Ravi Zacharias, and Bob alluded to him earlier. Uh, And he talks about the last 20 years in the church, we've done something that's kind of been subtle, but it's been pretty damaging. We, we've wrapped ourselves in the emotional aspect of coming to God or we raise our hands or we sing a song and there are a whole lot of tears sometimes because of sin in our lives or something. But there's not an understanding of who God is. We don't understand who Jesus is. And, and I, the only thing I can liken it to, it's like, it's like somebody who gets married, you know, and they have a big wedding and they're, they're really excited, and they exchange vows, and they exchange rings, and everything's... Re- and I, have you ever talked to anybody who's going to have a wedding? They get really excited about that, and the emotion's high, and then they spend the next 20 years living apart. They don't know each other. They're not close to each other. And then we wonder why the divorce rate is so high. It's because during that 20-year span, there might have been some high points But in order to get through the difficult times, in order to be strong when Satan attacks with all that he has, we have to make sure that we are getting the presence of God in our lives on a daily basis. You see, to follow Jesus Christ, folks, is not just a a once-a-week deal. It's not something we do on Sunday. It's not something we do just in a small group. This, This life called you know, following Jesus is something that he gave to us that we would have apply to our lives every day. It's not, it's not just, you know, something to do. It's, it's who we are. And, and so today I want to talk about that. I want us to understand that our real faith, if it's real, it has to happen Every day. You see, when Jesus came in, he called the disciples. He didn't say, I'm going to come in, Peter. I'm going to help you with your fishing business. I'm going to come and, you know, I'm going to rearrange the books so you make more money. I'm going to show you where all the great fishing spots are so that you'll catch more fish. That's not what he did at all. In fact, he came to where those guys were fishing. He said, I want you to drop your nets. I want you to walk away from your businesses. I want you to follow me. You may be an expert at fishing for fish, but I'm going to call you to be fishers of men. And in order for you to do that, you're going to have to be close to me. And you're going to have to get to know me. And so today, I want to encourage our hearts with all that I have, with with all that I am, to let you know that we're playing games if we don't spend every day with God. Our relationship with God is not real. It's it's just kind of a religious experience from, from time to time. And I guess what I'm saying is this. What we do daily will come out in our lives when we face difficulty. What we do daily comes out when we face difficulty. It becomes real and it becomes in our lives. Uh, a few weeks ago, I talked to you about the difference between you know, being like a mushroom and an oak tree, right? I said when fa- things that grow fast usually die fast. And uh, you guys have seen it, haven't you, in your yards, these little white mushrooms, right? And they grow real fast, and they're there, and we see them, and they're just so easy to kick over, right? They have no substance. But then you see oak tree, which takes about 100 years, you know. And you, you go, you kick an oak tree, and you're not going to knock it over. It's got, it's got substance. It's strong. And so let me ask you this question. Are you, are you and it's right up here, are you a mushroom, or are you an oak tree follower of Jesus? Which one are you? You see, you see, you see, I want to ask you a question today. And I know some of you, if you've been a believer for many years, you've heard this question asked of you before. But today I want you to just take a moment and to ask yourselves internally. I want you to ask your hearts and your soul this question. 
because one day it may be asked of you. If you were accused of being a follower of Jesus, would there be enough evidence to convict you? If you were accused of being a follower of Jesus Christ, would people look at your life and look at my life and say, yeah, that person is one who follows Jesus, or that person says they follow Jesus, but we see something else. You know, Paul says this in Philippians 1.6. Would you read this verse with me, please? Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Let me ask you a really, really honest question that I want you to ask yourself. Is that happening to you? Is God doing a work in you and bringing it to completion? Or are you stalled out? Are you in neutral? Are you stuck in your walk with Jesus Christ? There's a word you hear me use a lot. And, and it's a word that can get you into trouble if you're a follower of Christ. And it's the word surrender. You hear me talk about it all the time. There's a difference between commitment and surrender. Commitment I control. I can control my commitments. But when I surrender, I can't control that. That's, that's simply saying, okay, I give up. And so sometimes people will come to me and they'll look at me with, and, and they're really honest and, and, and they come with this kind of frustration in their heart and this kind of confusion in their soul and they ask the question this. They ask this question. They say, what does it mean to be surrendered? What does that really mean in my life? Well, let me give you the definition first. Surrender means this, okay? To yield something to the possession of, or power of another. Would you, would you read that with me? To yield something to the possession or power of another. In other words, I take what I have possession of, and if I surrender it, I'm giving it to the possession of somebody else to control. And now what does that mean for me and God? Well, that means that the decisions that I make in life are not based on what I feel are not based on what's down deep in my soul, but are based on what Jesus says, are based on what the Bible teaches. And so in other words, today you say, how do I work that in my daily life? Well, in the mornings when I want to get up and I know I'm supposed to have a quiet time with God, and I know I'm supposed to carve out time to spend with God and seek His face, and I say, I'd just rather sleep. I didn't surrender that day. Oh, I surrendered, but I surrendered to myself. I surrendered to my, what I want. And, and so surrendered means whatever decisions I make in life, I don't make them based on what I feel or what I think or what somebody else may think. I base them on what God says. When it comes to my finances, when it comes to my relationships, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to what I do and, 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 and who I hang around with and all those kind of things, I surrender what I want to do. I surrender what somebody else may want me to do for the sake of what God wants me to do based on what he teaches in his word and based on what his spirit is teaching in my heart and my life. So this morning, I want to share with you a, a guy who who we know if I when I tell you the story you're going to say oh I heard that story when I was a kid and some of you may have and some of you may know exactly how the story goes in fact you know when I was a kid what they used to do nowadays we got the tv screens and all that but when I was a kid we had flannel graph how many remember flannel graph yeah you cut out these little things and then you got this kind of board and it sticks supposed to stick to it and so you know, sometimes when I hear certain stories in the Bible, I'm brought back to the flannel graph, you know, uh, picture of Joseph or Daniel. But today we're going to talk about a guy by the name of Daniel. And if I were to say, what is Daniel famous for? Most of you would say, well, Daniel's famous for the lion's den, right? How many have ever heard that story? Daniel and the lion's den. Raise your hand. If you haven't, I want to share it with you today. If you have, I want you to look at it through Daniel through a different perspective. I want you to see something that gets missed because here's what happens. We look at, we look at miracles that happen in the Bible and we say, oh, I'm, 
I wish God would do that in my life. Don't you? Don't you wish that when your friends are, you know, just, just kind of giving you a hard time about who Jesus is and you're trying to be an example for Christ, you're sharing Christ, that he would do what he did with Elijah and send fire down? You ever had anybody you wish they'd send fire on? Okay, <laughs> don't do that. Okay, uh, have you ever wished that God would give you a Red Sea experience? Maybe in your finances, you know, the waters of, of debt are just flooding. You say, God, please part the sea, you know, financial seas. How many would, ever, would say, God, I want that kind of power in my life? You know, or, or a relationship, you know, nothing's ever working right. And so I need you to just part the relational waters in my life. How, how many would really want the power of God in your life? Okay, raise your hand. I'm here to tell you, you can have and be, have access to the power of God in your life to do things that you couldn't do on your own. But there's, there's, there's a catch, okay? Not really a catch. If you want the power of God, you've got to be in the presence of God. And I want to share with you this guy named Daniel. Now, let me tell you a little bit about him. Daniel was, a, was of course, an Israelite, and he was captured by the Babylonians who had taken over basically the known world at the time. And they took him and many other young men and they took the best and they brought them into the Babylonian palace and they were to be trained in Babylonian ways. And even though that these guys were trained in Babylonian ways, Daniel was one of them who said, I purpose in my heart to follow my God and his word. And he did it through his whole life. And so when the Babylonian Empire fell, the, the new empire that rose up was the Medo-Persian Empire, or, or later to be known as the Persian Empire. And, uh, and, and even then, Daniel was a man of character. Daniel was a man of integrity. Daniel was a man who loved and served God no matter what the government was, no matter what the pressures of life were. Daniel had proven himself faithful. Not because every once in a while God did something special for him. But as you'll find out as we go to the story, Daniel was a guy who continually followed after God. Now, Daniel chapter 6, I'm going to read to you. We're going to read. I'll have you read a little bit with me, and I'll read to you, and we'll get this story, and we'll understand, hopefully, a message that will help us understand how we're to live. Daniel chapter 6, verse 1 says, it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps. Those are satraps are, 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 were government officials that he would use and appoint to help him rule the kingdom. Darius rule the kingdom. To rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators. So he had all these government officials and he had three guys that they were to, uh, to be accountable to. Okay? And he said uh, over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. So they were to make sure everything was done in order because, because I'm, I know it's different than our, than our uh, day and age, but government sometimes can be corrupt. Would you agree with that? Okay, okay verse, verse 3. Now, now Daniel, so get this, so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his, what, exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. In other words, other than the king, this guy would be, he'd be number two in command. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find ground for charges against Daniel and his conduct of government affairs. But they were unable to do so. Okay, let me, let me just say this. The Babylonian Empire and the Persian Empire were not Christian you know, based, okay? <laughs> they were pagan-based. They were ungodly. All kinds of things went on in these governments. Uh, but in the midst of an ungodly government, Daniel stood strong in his relationship with God. Okay? And, and it says that when they looked at... In fact, it says that when, they, when, when all these leaders who were jealous of Daniel looked at him, they couldn't find anything against him. It said they could find no corruption, uh, no corruption, in him because he was what? Trustworthy and neither corrupt or negligent. Finally, these men said, listen to this, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with what? Read with us with me. With the law of his God. 
I will, we will you try to find some kind of loophole. We will try, try to find some kind of angle in his law because we know why. Because we know that Daniel is a man of integrity. We know that Daniel is a man who will follow his God. No matter what we say, no matter what we do, you know, the only way we're going to get him is if we can get his law, the law of his God to be at conflict with the law of King Darius. And so they devised a plan. It says, so these administrators and satraps went as groups to the king and said, may King Darius live forever. Now, they're, they're, we used to use the term, uh, you might use the term, but we used to use the term brown nosing or buttering up or whatever. He was trying to, you know, he said, may King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone, listen, what did they say? Who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except you, your majesty, O king, wonderful, godly king, god king that you are, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians which cannot be repealed. And, you know, what they did with King Darius is what people do with other leaders in charge. They appeal to their selfishness. They appeal to their pride. They, they appeal to his ego. King, we think you're such a great guy. We think you're so wonderful that we're going to make a law that nobody can pray to anybody around here but you. And if they do, we want them to, because you're so great, king. <laughs> you're so mighty. Really, it had nothing to do with the king's greatness. It had everything to do with their own selfishness and their own self-centeredness. But by the way, never believe your own press releases, okay? It'll get you in trouble. <laughs> and he says, and he goes on to say, uh, he says, now your majesty issue the decree and put it in writing so it cannot be altered. And, and so the King Darius put the decree, verse 9, in writing. Now, I want you to read this next section with me because it kind of brings us to where we uh, look at Daniel and we see, about, we, we see uh, inside his character and who he is. Verse 10. Here we go. Ready? Now, when Daniel learned that the decree... Come on, you guys are dying on me. Come on. Here we go. Let's try again. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published... He went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Get this. Three times a day, he got on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God. And that's the key. That's the key. So, so Daniel comes home. He hears the decree. He knows that what he's about to do is in direct violation to the law of the Medes and the Persians. And he knows that the penalty for violating this law means his, he, will be, he will be tattered and torn amidst you know, vicious, hungry lions. So he knows it. But notice what it says. And you guys read it. Now, the reason I want you to read it is because I think it'll stick a little bit better. And, and notice what he says. He says, it says, three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God. Read this part with me again. I just want to make sure it sinks in. Verse 11, he says this. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying. Surprise, you know, they knew what he was going to do. And asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about this royal decree, his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any God or human being except you, your, ma your majesty, almighty one, would be thrown into the lion's den? And the king answered, the decree stands. Well, of course. In accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. Look at verse 13. <clears throat> then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. Notice what it Read this next part with me. Because it brings it home again. Read it again. He prays three times. 
he still prays three times. In other words, he hasn't quit. This is nothing new. He's, he's not trying to defy you necessarily, but he's defying the law that, the, that you put in order, but he's still violent. Even though we told him no, he still prays three times a day. Verse 14, when the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He, he loved Daniel. He didn't, he didn't want... He didn't want him anything to happen to him. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men w uh, went as a group to King Darius and said to him, Remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no decree or, ed or edict that the king issues can be changed. Verse 16. So the king gave the order and brought, they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. Notice, what, read what the king, with me, what the king says to Daniel. You ready? May your God, whom you serve, what's that word? No, no, wait, wait. Serve how? Come on, let's do it together. Rescue you. And here it is again. What Daniel has done has been, not, not only was he a man of God, but he was a consistent man of God. Let's keep going. A stone, a stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace. Notice, notice the, 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 uh, the countenance of the king. The king returned to his palace, spent the night without eating, without any entertainment uh, being brought to him, and he could not sleep. In other words, this guy was just... He hated this to happen, and he was, he was anxious all night. And in and, and verse 19, at the first light of dawn, the king got up. He didn't sleep much and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice. Listen to this. You guys, if you hadn't heard anything else, listen to this. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God. Would you read this next part with me? Here we go. Come on. Whom you... Who you serve what? What did he say? Continually. I'm trying to make a point. I think you're getting it. Okay. Been able to rescue you from the lions. Daniel answered. May the king live forever. <laughs> the fact that he answered was good news. Okay. Okay. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. Verse 23, the king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And then he gets kind of upset over that. He says, and when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted, not this, not, not because he trusted at this time. I think this word trusted uh, means even a deeper meaning than just trusted in the den of lions. But he trusted, he's always trusted God. And then it goes on to say, then he goes on to say, at the king, and now it gets kind of gross, okay? At the king, their wives and children, it's pretty bad. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. That's not, that, that was tough. But anyway, verse 25. The, then King Darius wrote all, to all the nations and people of every language and to all the earth. Now, you got to hear this. Now, because Dan, listen, get this. Because Daniel continually, constantly, daily met with God. When he was put into a bad situation, God, the power, because he was in the presence of God, God, then the power of God brought, Shut the mouths of the lions. Okay? Now, now watch this. Here's, here's the point that I want you to get. When we uh, continually spend time with God, and when we go through the lion den of our lives, and people see that, you know what they see? They see that our God is real and powerful. King Darius saw that, and look, look what he did here. Would you read this with me? May you prosper greatly. Verse 26. Here we go. Come on. I issued a decree that every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God. 
For he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued from the... And then here's notice what he says. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. Now, now listen. To surrender to God doesn't mean that it's a constant, that, that we're constantly, you know, suffering. It may mean suffering. It may mean that we've got to trust God during a period of suffering. Or he may prosper us. We often think that, oh, if I surrender to God, that means I'm going to be constantly in pain. I'm going to be constantly, you know, humiliated. And, 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 and there may be some of that. But here's what you're going to find. That if you spend time daily in the presence of God, you will get the power of God in your life. And He will be bright. And lives will be transformed. This, whole king, this king's heart was transformed. Why? Because there was a man who had the courage not to just say, I'll walk into the, the den of lions and I'll stand for God. But he had the courage to constantly seek the face of God no matter what. No matter what. And when that begins to happen, God does some amazing things in our lives. You see, the power of God came. And it's true for Daniel and it's true for us. The power of God came as a result of the presence of God. Before God worked through Daniel, get this, he worked in Daniel. And before God will work through you and through me, he will first work in me. Let me give you the bottom line. <clears throat> we will never see the great power of God until we possess the daily presence of God. Would you read that with me? We will never see the great power of God until we possess the daily presence of God. When we develop the daily presence of God, here's what begins to happen. We, re, we begin over time to release ourselves. Listen to me. Please. We release ourselves and the Spirit of God unleashes Himself in us. We begin to release ourselves and God begins to unleash His Spirit in us. As daily, you know, when we spend time with God daily, it's not just going through a routine. It's not just reading a Bible verse here or there. What we need to be doing, we're practicing our faith. And faith simply means to surrender, to turn over what I have to what God wants. To release who I am so God can do what he wants in me. And when that begins to happen, there begins to be a change in our lives. And it changes no matter what the circumstances, no matter what the problem. You might look at people who go through like persecution and you say, boy, how can they do that? How can... Because God, they have been with God. They have experienced the presence of God. And then at those moments when nobody thinks they can do anything and they think they're, and, and everybody thinks that they're done, God gives them his power. Sometimes it's the power to die with peace and grace. Sometimes it's the power to overcome death and be a testimony and a light for the gospel. I got to tell you, when, when we went to Ethiopia, um, I don't know if it was a highlight. It was a tough time. There was this, and I've shown you the picture of this guy before, and, and I, 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 we couldn't find it today, babe, but his, his name's Pastor DeLilly. And Pastor DeLilly, uh, loves God. And so he told us a story, and My, Michael told me a story of this guy by the name of Pastor Dilley, who, who, um, who uh, uh, ten guys got around him and beat him up and beat him with the purpose of killing him. And he was left for dead. And because of God's grace, you know, we don't see a lot of this 
in our lives. I wonder if we're too comfortable. I wonder if, I wonder if we, we don't see the power of God because we don't know God. Anyway, so this guy goes back and he gets beaten and his family is, is, is uh, threatened. And he was told, in fact, uh, by the way, when we gave money for Ethiopia, Pastor DeLilly was one of the pastors who we were able to pay for his trip to come to Bahadar, put him up for a night, uh, feed him, and then do the pastor's training for these guys. Uh, and as he would left and, got, and was getting ready to get on the bus to come to Bahadar, they told him, those persecutors told him, if you come back, we'll kill you and your family. Has, has anybody ever said that to you? Nobody's ever said it to me either. You, you know what I would be inclined to do? Take my family and not come back. And so we did an interview with him. And Garrett, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to show this interview. Um, we did an interview with Pastor DeLilly, and uh, it was <laughs> kind of humorous. Not, not, not in what he said, but in what happened. And so I'm asking Michael to ask him these questions, and he begins to talk about how his family's threatened and, and how you know he's going through. And in the middle of this interview, I, I, I just can't handle it anymore. And I start to break down. I, you know, it's got, you know, because here's what I was thinking. I was thinking, when this trip is over, I'm going home to my beautiful wife. I'm going home to my family. I got to spend time with my grandkids this weekend, four of them anyway. And, and boy, are they fun. Have you, have you got grandkids? They're so much fun. Uh, little Bryson, four years old. Last night, can I tell you, I'm, this is just us, right? This is personal stuff. I wouldn't normally say it if everybody was, you might want to take it off the TV. Uh, but anyway, uh, so he comes to me and, he's, and, and, and Robin's in there cooking cabbage, okay? He's frying cabbage. You ever smelled what cabbage fry, you know? So, so Beckham comes to me and he says, he says, uh, what's that smell? And I said, and I said, what do you think it is? And he looked at me and he said, is it you? <laughs> I said, no. <laughs> but that was fun. And I, and I tell him my old dad's stories, all my grand, one of the older ones who don't as much, but the younger ones. And Xander was here last night. and he, He's so polite. He'll, pull up, he'll come up next to me, sit in my lap and say, tickle me, please. <laughs> okay. Uh, but I got to come home to my family. I got to go home and know that unless something strange happens, nobody's going to hurt them. My grandkids are protected. My kids are doing pretty good. But Pastor DeLilly was told, if you come back, your family could be dead. And you too. And I looked at him, and he was looking, and I was crying in this interview. And he's looking at me like, What is wrong with you? And I said, Michael, I, and so I go to him, and I, you know, a guy like that is a hero to me. So I go to him, and I look him straight in the eyes, and I said, I said, Pastor Lily, you're my hero. Thank you for the courage of. You know, living your life for the gospel. And he said something to the effect through the translation like, that's my life. That's what I signed up for. I signed up to serve Jesus Christ no matter what. And I love him. And I love the gospel. And I'm not going to stop telling anybody that I can tell, no matter what they do to me, unless they kill me. I'm, you know, and, and he looked at me like, you know, that's nothing to cry about. That's my life. And I said, oh, God. Oh, God. May I meet with you enough that your presence is so real that when difficulty like that comes, I would have that kind of courage. You know, 
when I was had a talk with somebody this the other day that's kind of spurred, spurred this. I, I love our children's ministries. I think we have wonderful children's ministry. But I want to tell you something. That's not the most effective ministry to our kids. Having them in there and having them a good time, and I'm not against that. That's, that's good stuff and all that. But the greatest ministry that our kids can see is us. Right now, we have the strongest... The children's ministry is right here in this room. It's us dads and moms and grandpas and grandmas who will decide that I have decided to follow Jesus. And all the fun in the world doesn't change that in a child's mind. But what will is a mom and dad who will be so, so surrendered to Jesus Christ that when they and see the presence of God. You see, you can fool a lot of people as being a father, but you can't fool your kids, right? They know who this guy is. They know what I am. And they know my mess-ups. And, and they could tell you plenty of them. But I hope they know this. I hope you know that your dad loves Jesus Christ. I hope you'll take that with you stronger than any Christian school, that's stronger than any big ministry, is if we'll live our lives surrendered daily to Jesus Christ. You say, but I, I'm not strong enough. I can't do that. And I would say to you, you're right. You can't do that on your own. You saw the little bumper video of, the, of that song, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. And you saw, listen, and you saw what a guy would do to follow Jesus Christ, and that was tough. But I'm here to tell you, the only thing that's going to change this world, the only, hey, by the way, let me say something just real clear. I'm going to get a little political right now. You, you ready for this? Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton are not going to change America. You can tell their campaigns, I said it. I don't care. I don't care. Donald Trump's not going to make America great again and Hillary Clinton is not going to bring us together. The only one that's going to change the trajectory of this world is Jesus Christ. The only one that's going to change the, the, the climate of our country is Jesus Christ. He has always been the one who has done it. Not because of anybody else, but him. And when we turn away from him, no matter, I don't care if you're Republican, Democrat, Independent, Libertarian, or nothing. It doesn't matter. If you turn away from him, you will find pain and confusion and heartbreak. So if you're here today, And you really want to minister to your children. And you really want to minister to your grandchildren. And you really want to minister to your nieces and nephews and cousins and whoever. Be like Daniel in the sense that every day, spend time with God. I say divert daily. In other words, carve out time every day to follow Jesus. Read his word. You say, but oh, the Bible's so hard to understand. And I agree. Then, then write down questions and ask people and there are commentaries and there are books. You know, begin to be a student of the word. And then write out your prayers. Try that. You know, pray R-rated prayers. Say, God, my life stinks. My, my marriage is bad. All the, my fine, you know, begin to just tell him how you feel. He can handle those emotions. Spend time with them. Carve out that time every day. And then withdraw weekly. Not, o not, only, not only come here every Sunday, but find a good small group where you can begin to build connections and relationships with as together we, in, we, we go through the difficulties of life and we seek the presence of God. And then I say this, abandon annually. Maybe even more than that, where you get away, not for your vacation, 
not for just, I mean, those are good times. I'm not saying that's bad, but will you just get away and fast a day or two? And will you seek the face of God and just say, God, I, I want to lead my family right. I want to lead my family. I want to lead my children and my grandchildren. You know, I often thought that once my parent and when my kids grew up and left the house, that my parenting ended, but I found out that it, it just changed, didn't end. In fact, in some respects, it's more important. So now I'm working with uh, my kids, hopefully. Then I got grandkids, and I want to touch their lives and impact their lives. Listen, we have a choice what to do with our time, in America especially. And I encourage you, if you want the power of God, listen to me, and I do, begin to get the presence of God. And not that he's not there, he's everywhere, but invite him. Release yourself so that the Spirit of God will unleash himself in you. When that begins to happen, you're going to have a strength and a power that only he can give and a peace that transcends all human understanding. Would you bow your heads for me? If you're here today and you say, Pastor Steve, I've never received Christ. Never received him in my life, but I do feel a tug and I do feel a pull today and, and, and I feel like God's Spirit is calling himself to me. which simply says, I'm taking my life, and it's a surrender in God's faithfulness, which simply means I'm going to take it and I'm going to save you. I'm going to change you. Simply say this, something like this to God. Dear God, I'm a sinner. I've messed up. I've blown it. And I invite Jesus Christ to come into my life, to make me a new person inside. I confess with my mouth, Lord Jesus and I believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead. And today, I want to fully follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, look at me here for just a minute. If today you receive Christ in your life, you meant business with God. In your program, there's a tear-off thing, communication slip that says, Today I receive Christ. Here's what I want you to do. Just fill it out, check where it says, Today I receive Christ. Give it to Craig in the back or put it in the... Uh, white buckets and we'll send you some information that will help in your next step. Now listen, if you're a follower of Jesus and maybe maybe you've been stifled a little bit. Maybe maybe you're not following so much anymore. Maybe you've drifted. Maybe the enthusiasm. Listen. The enthusiasm has died down. And you know what older Christians tell you? Listen, they say, well, that's just going to happen. You know something? Here's what I, I'm going to tell you this personally. The closer I get to Jesus Christ, the more excited I get. And I'm old now, okay? And I'm old now. You know, I know preachers, they used to, when they were young, they were excited. But I'm more excited now than I've ever been because God is more real to me today than he's ever been. And I see his power. When, when you're able to go to Ethiopia and see the power of God, when even though they throw rocks, and you're able to see people who say, I have nothing, but all I have is Jesus, and that's enough. When you begin to see, when you begin to experience the presence of God, you begin to see the power of God. And that's why I... I love ministry today more than I ever have. More than I ever have. You say, but Pastor, what if we fire you? Go ahead. I'll just go somewhere and, and, and you know, I'm not, people don't control that in me. Only the Spirit of God does. So folks, listen, maybe today we need to say no more drifting. No more playing spiritual games. No more playing church. No more going through religious motions. Today, we're going to fully surrender. Can't worry about tomorrow, but today we're going to fully surrender. We're going to carve out that time for the presence of God, and when God is ready, He's going to send His power into my life. Maybe that's you. Would you stand with me?
I'm going to pray. And then if God's spirit moves on you and you need to come and pray, maybe there's a sin you need to confess. Maybe there's something in the way between you and God and you need to get it out of the way. This is the time for you to do that. Or maybe you just need to say, you know, I'm going to be the children's ministry in my home. I'm going to be a, the Daniel in my home. And I'm going to daily seek God. And no matter what the government does, my kids are going to see Jesus Christ alive and well in me. Maybe that needs to be your move today. Father, do something in your church. And we'll be careful to give you all the credit. In Jesus' name, amen. Won't you come as we sing?